Hi everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Peggy. Uh, I'm from Swaziland. I've been uh, uh, here at the Centre on Law and Social Transformation. So I would like to welcome you to this uh, discussion we are having this morning. Uh, it's a discussion uh, about politics, uh, politics of corruption in Peru and uh, Brazil. This uh, breakfast seminar is organized by the Center on Law and Social Transformation, which is a center in collaboration with the University of Bergen and the Christensen uh, Mikkelsen Institute. Uh, we are also in collaboration with the uh, Bergen Global. Uh, corruption is becoming uh, a most, more central in political mobilization in both entrenched democracies and in fairly young democracies. From uh, President Trump's rhetoric of uh, draining the swamp to the rise of uh, President Bolsonaro in Brazil. Corruption is a global phenomenon. No state can claim to be immune from corruption. The Corruption uh, Perception Index of 2018 by Transparency International shows a clear link between uh, having a healthy democracy, successfully functioning public sector uh, service, corruption is much more likely to flourish where democratic foundations are weak, and we have seen in many countries uh, where undemocratic and populist uh, politicians capture democratic institutions and use them uh, to their advantage. With the shrink shrinking democratic space and the undermining of democratic institutions in the last decade, as shown by the Freedom House, corruption is to become even more central in politics as we move forward. This morning we will discuss the politics of corruption in Peru and Brazil. These are fairly young uh, democracies. They have just democratized in the last uh, three decades. Both countries have experienced uh, brutal uh, military dictatorships before the transitions uh, into, into democracy. It is interesting to note that uh, both the presidents of uh, Brazil and Peru seemingly they represent two ideological fronts, the left and the right. But still, there is the strong rhetoric to claim uh, corruption in their countries. To understand these dynamics, uh, today we will have uh, two distinguished uh, scholars who will help us understand uh, this topic. I will introduce uh, Professor Florian Hoffman, who is, the, who is a professor at the law department at the university in, uh, in Rio. He is also an associate researcher in the Human Rights Center. His work has focused mostly on uh, international law and human rights, particularly the interface between law and development. He will help us uh, understand the topic uh, this morning. And we have uh, Camila Ginella from Peru. He's a global fellow here at uh, Law Transform and a researcher at Christian Mikkelsen uh, Institute. Camila is part of the projects that uh, deal with, uh, with sexual health and reproductive rights. So we'll help us uh, understand what is happening in Peru. This is how we will structure the discussion this morning. So Camila will start by having a presentation, uh, followed by uh, Florian. And then after that, I will ask them a few questions, and then I open up the discussion uh, to the floor. Okay. Yes, uh, Camila, over okay. to you. Thank, Thank you, you. Becky. So what we thought that was probably um, to start to give some context of what is going on in, in these countries and what we are speaking about politics of corruption. Um, as Peruvian, I grew up in a country in the 80s and the, and the 90s watching a lot of Brazilian soup operas. Um, and, um, and the Brazilian soup operas influenced the whole region. And uh, this is since that is happening now. Uh, and one of the, of the soup operas that was super big in the 90s was called a proxima victima, who is going to be the next victim. And, um, and the, what is going on in, in Peru has, is really close linked with the, what is going with the Odebrecht ca case, the Lava Jato, the Watch Car uh, case, and how that is affecting the, the Peruvian politics. So 
what we knew in 2016 when we have the, gen the general elections and, and after that 2017 when the other case come through in, in Peru, there was a uh, lot of the politicians who were involved on, on, on this case, in the, in the Lava Yato case. So this, this is the, and that invo involved former president uh, Toledo, former president Alan Garcia, former president Mumala, and, and his wife Narino Heredia. Susana Villaranda was the mayor of, of Lima, she was from the, from the left. Uh, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, that in 2017 was the president of the Republic, and Castañeda Lozio, that was the mayor of Lima in that moment. So we knew that, this, that, that all these people were in a way linked with the Lavallato case, and that um, Marcelo Odebrecht mentioned all of the, uh, them in the in interrogations. Um, what happened after is that in 2016, we have a general election. In 2017, we have a, a Congress with the majority of the Fujimorist party and the, and the party from Alan Garcia. And they decide to confirm an, an investigation uh, commission that, in a way, wants to see the Odebrecht case as this. To target only the people that they believe that they were the enemies. And they built up a case and, and a report, and a, a report that was released at the, in 2018 that was saying, okay, so uh, Umala was corrupt, and, and Pedro Ca Pablo Kuczynski, that was the president, uh, he worked for Umala, who he's also corrupt. Uh, Susana Villarán is corrupt, and uh, uh, Umala is uh, corrupt. And this also has like an ideological thing because uh, Susana Villarán and Umala were portrayed as part of the left and progressive and close to the PT and Lula da Silva. Uh, so that is the way that they, they, that they wanted to, to manage the case and all, only to target these people. Um, what happened in 2018 that in Peru is uh, everything can change like that in one day to another is that this is called courts and corruption. And there were some audios that were released that, were, that record the judges in um, many judges uh, from the superior court, from, from the higher court, that were involved in corruption acts. And that involved the Inostrosa, that was the, the chief of the court, and a lot of the judges that were related to, to select the judges. And they were corrupt, and they were linked to the APRA, from the, the party from the former president Alan Garcia, a link to uh, Keiko Fujimori, the leader of the opposition. So when this happened, and then also linked some people at the prosecutor's office, the prosecutor office, the chief of the prosecutor office, uh, Ch Gonzalo Chavarri, decided to, to show to the, to the public opinion, ah, but I am fighting against corruption. I am going to change the team in charge of the Lava Yato team because they are not doing much. And he made this, he put these two guys, Perez and Vela, these are the prosecutors, thinking Chavarri in that moment that he can control them. He didn't knew that they didn't have any political interest to, to support what, they, what he was doing, and he decided, and this team decided to, to start to really to inquire Keiko Fujimori, Alan Garcia, as all the other people from the, from the political spectrum. And they have Carguancho as a judge that he put in prevent, precautionary prison to Ollantumala, but they were thinking, yeah, this, this judge is only going to touch them, but they didn't put in the table that this guy was sending to jail to everyone. He, has, he, he really believed that these people have to go to, to, to jail because they, they can't escape. So when this, this team come in a, in, in, at the middle of 2018, then they put in the, uh, under the inquiry, all of these, and I don't know why the picture of Keiko Fujimori is not coming here, <laughs> because she's supposed to be there. But, um, but she was also in, in, the, in the investigation. So now we have Keiko Fujimori that is not in the, in the, in the, in the, in the pictures, and, all, and a lot of, 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 of more people, all 
from the different spectrum. It's not just targeting one political party. And that is important because I think that is a big difference with what is going in other parts of Latin America. You have to the uh, Christian party, uh, Villanueva that was formed from the left. He was uh, president of a region and he was the prime minister for the for now, President Vizcarra, he just left the, the, the church before we know that he was involved also with the Odebrecht. Former President Toledo, former President Alan Garcia, the king himself, just to avoid to be sent to jail, he, was, he killed himself in April this year. Um, former President Kuczynski, that was that quit from, uh, <laughs> uh, from, the, from the church and, and he's under domiciliary prison. Uh, Keiko Fujimori, that is not in the pictures, uh, but she is still in jail. She is going to be in jail un until uh, April 2020. Castañeda Locio, he, he was the mayor of Lima, and how he, now he cannot go out of the country because of the judge say that. Ollantumala and Nadine Heredia were sent already to precautionary prison, but now they, they are in their houses, but they cannot leave the country. And Susana Villarán, that was from the left, and she is also in the same jail with uh, Keiko Fujimori. So when you have that in the, <laughs> and if everyone is, is involved, uh, then it's, it's, it's much more difficult to, to, to use this as only to target one group because it's in, in a way it's, now the discussion is who is the most corrupt. And, um, but that doesn't mean that the, that the thing is easy. So the Lava Jato team has been, the people in the, the majority in the Congress has been trying really to, to say, okay, this is not good for us. It's not good for our political interest. So we try to control, we have to control the team. On, at the, on New Year's Eve, what they did is they, they took out Bella and Jose Domingo Perez from the, from the Lava Jato team. And, uh, and that, and I mean, in New Year's Eve, you don't do that because people is partying, yeah? And in Peru, people travel outside, go to the beach, that because it's, it's summer. So th that was strategic. I mean, they, they, they did this press conference at seven o'clock in the night. We were like, what is going on here? But, uh, but uh, Rafael Bell and Jose Domingo Perez say, we are not going out. I mean, we are, and they stayed in the offices. They said, nobody's going to touch our papers. And they have a lot of, public support. So people went to the streets to support the two prosecutors. And at the end, they, they, they have to be restituted in, in, the, in the positions. So when they saw that they didn't manage to do that, the Fujimoristas and the APRA, that they were really touching in that moment, they decided to go against the agreement with Odebrecht, just to stop the people from Odebrecht to continue speaking and continue giving names. So that has been the last battle, and that is explain what is going on now in Peru. Why they wanted this control, the constitutional court. So then they have a case against the Odebrecht agreement at the constitutional court, and if you have the judges from the constitutional court, then it's over. Um, and that has been the, the last attempt that was, that was happening. So they forced to try to, 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 to select, to put people that they are going to, for their interest, to protect them from the Odebrecht case, from the corruption attacks, uh, cases. And, uh, and Vizcarra, the president Vizcarra said, please don't do that. Don't do that because we need to fight against corruption in this country. They continue, they, they, they continue with the election and that was happening like uh, one week ago. President Vizcarra has this constitutional power that was created by Alberto Fujimori because Peru has a really presidentialist regime with a really presidentialist constitution that allows the president to close the, uh, the to shut down the, the Congress. Um, and that happened uh, last Monday. Um, Vizcarra came to say, okay, we have done all what we could, but this the Fujimoristas have the majority on the Congress, they don't listen, with other allies that are also touched by the corruption. So we need to close the Congress. And, uh, and this was a constitutional mechanism. It's not ideal. It's not that we are celebrating that we went to that extreme. It's nothing to celebrate. Um, but it's raising the political opinion awareness. 
And this picture is the people out of the Congress celebrating that the Congress was going out. Because people is, 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 is tired. Uh, and we can discuss, and, and, and that is just to, to discussion afterwards, is probably it's, it's too much power to the prosecutors. We don't know really if Rafael Vela and Domingo Perez is there going to become like a political actor and in the case of Brazil. They have a lot of power and people, people like them. Um, People go put, uh, for Halloween, the kids have the costumes of Jose Domingo Perez. That is, that is quite funny, but it's what is. So they are like stars. Uh, and probably that is too much power to put it in two prosecutors and, and, in, the, and in Carguancho. Uh, the other problem is that this is just being only about people, like bad people, bad politicians. And we are not having the, the, the opportunity to discuss about the model, what allowed this, why we, we continue uh, promoting these public-private partnerships the, the, uh, the, without much regulation to try to avoid this huge case of corruption and also to discuss about political party financing because other rich give money to all the political spectrum because they, 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 want, they want to have a link with, to, to any, with anyone. And we also don't know what is going to happen because now we have to wait for the Constitutional Court to say if this was constitutional or not. Uh, the Constitutional Court is shaking. They, they, don't, they are in the... Uh, everyone is, is watching them. So we will see the correlation of power in the Constitutional Court is so-so. So, uh, so we'll, we'll see what is going on in the next months. In principle, we are going to have elections only for the Congress for one and a half year in January, and general elections in 2021. Okay, this is just to give you some background from the Peruvian situation, and we can speak afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Camila. Uh, yeah, Florian. Yes. I uh, don't have a clue. Yeah. Because I hear the. Wait. So. Is this working now? Yeah? Okay, great. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, an enormous pleasure to be here. I've uh, been dreaming, so to speak, uh, of being at the Institute here uh, for a long time, and this is an enormous pleasure. Thanks, uh, Becky, for the uh, uh, kind introduction. Uh, as, I, as, as was mentioned, I'm from the, in, in fact, Catholic University, or there are several universities in Rio. Uh, uh, in Rio, I am coming to this from a sort of hybrid uh, uh, observational position. I'm a German, I've been living and working in Brazil for a long time, on and off, so to speak, and uh, I've been now, of course, subject to these recent developments which complement uh, what's happening in, in Peru uh, uh, in, a, in a significant way, as we've just seen. So, um, politics of corruption. I mean, everyone knows the, uh, the code name, in a sense, for the big operation now is Lava Jato, Car Wash. Uh, uh, the Brazilian uh, Federal Prosecutor's Office and the Brazilian Federal Police love to give these very martial, hardcore names for all their anti-corruption uh, 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 processes and proceedings. And of course, um, we can see very broadly, you know, this is sort of the, uh, 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 the way in which uh, they like to present it. So, for example, we've had more than uh, a thousand uh, 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 search and... Uh, um, and, and confiscate mandates. We've had uh, uh, here 227, about 230 uh, 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 forced, in a sense, uh, hearings where people are, uh, you know, not are released then, but have to basically follow to a police station. We've had. Uh, uh, obviously, a, a, a large number of convictions with very draconian sentences. Over a thousand years of prison terms have been handed down. So this is really sort of the uh, quintessential fight. Uh, it seems the way in which it is uh, styled uh, against um, against uh, corruption, and of course. Um, uh, if you go by the uh, federal prosecutor's office, uh, this was a uh, yeah. How is this going to now appear? I hope here it's, that's going to work. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> so why doesn't it want to? Right, and how do we? 
augment this now? Yes, okay. So this was an infamous, some of you might have seen this, this was an infamous slide shown by one of the heads prosecutors about two years ago. Uh, before Bolsonaro's election, yeah, uh, 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 where um, basically in a public PowerPoint presentation, and again, this is the pro uh, public prosecutor's office in a, an ongoing investigation, yeah, give pr a press conference where they basically create this idea. So everything in the end points to Lula. Yeah. Now, what has happened since? Lula is in prison since early last year. He's been uh, sentenced uh, earlier even, in, in late 2017. He was, uh, was free for a time, uh, but then on, on uh, having lost the last appeal, he was actually uh, imprisoned. And um, uh, the, he couldn't run, obviously, for the election. The election was won by, uh, uh, as we know, uh, uh, an ultra-right-wing candidate, um, uh, uh, Jair Bolsonaro. Now we can. I, I'll show you this very quickly. Uh, okay, uh, where of course he basically uh, uh, managed to to win. Uh, I mean, it's it's funny electoral politics. The north of Brazil is of course much less populated. This is like the American political maps, where it always looks like the Republicans win, but then all the Democrats are always strong. For example, in the East Coast, in some of the big cities. So Brazil too, you know, all the uh, the, the regions in a sense that electoral count are, are mostly in the so south, and of course that's where. He went, and of course, if you if you look at the electoral cycle, so Lula's first election, 2002, 2006, re-election, Dilma won, 2010, Dilma two, very contested, 2014, and then of course 2018. So that's how, in a sense, the descent of Brazil from what looked as a, a you know aspiring uh, post-transition social democracy, in a sense, yeah, uh, and now is is uh, sort of in the thralls of the hard right. Now the funny thing is, of course. That um, that uh, the funny thing is, of course, that uh, uh, the actors, especially the judicial actors, uh, uh, who brought about, in a sense, or at least accompanied in a very strong way, this particular development, were not necessarily, uh, initially at least, aligned with Bolsonaro. I mean, strangely enough, of course, uh, Sergio Moro, the most famous face of the investigations, is now the justice minister. Uh, uh, but at the same time, originally, these attempts were certainly more aligned with what used to be the center-right which had become electorally frustrated after losing four times against sort of the social democratic, you could say, alliance, and uh, decided after the 2014 elections and on the basis of the 2013 protest movement, which you may uh, broadly recall, which started sort of as a uh, lefty movement, was then to a certain extent hijacked by uh, right-wing groups, uh, and um, uh, that created, in a sense, the backdrop uh, against which f a, a first uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff was impeached. Yeah? Uh, that is, of course, a debate. Uh, depending on where you stand, you would argue this was a purely political impeachment. It wasn't really well-founded, at least by comparison, because the practices she was supposed to have engaged in, which in that case wasn't corruption, but was just uh, administrative malfeasance, uh, were common for pre in previous administrations and have been common since. So this was, in a sense, depending on your viewpoint, a pretext. Um, then led, of course, to a, a, a harsh austerity regime by the inter intermediate sort of uh, uh, in the intermediate period uh, uh, under the Tema government, uh, and then provided, in a sense, the opening for Bolsonaro, who, however, wasn't the centre rights. Uh, desired candidate originally. Yeah? I mean, there has now been a shift and some alliance, but the so-called centrao, the center, uh, uh, the, the, the right center who always considered itself to be the legitimate governors of Brazil in a sense, and who had obviously to a certain extent been sidelined by these Lula, Dilma, by the so-called Lulism period, uh, they of course were electorally essentially wiped out. Yeah? Uh, they lost much of their parliamentary support as well, and uh, the entire political system was then restructured. So what we can say is that what, amongst others, the Lava Jato investigation has produced is not just 
uh, a shift from the traditional left to the traditional right, again, in a sense. But um, in trying to do this, it has essentially completely reconfigured the political system to a point where it is now really anyone's guessing game what is exactly going to happen, how long Bolsonaro is going to stay in power, um, uh, uh, you know, how much more damage uh, he can do to the country, to the world. Yeah, we know of the Amazon fires, etc. So very briefly, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, remarks here on the sort of pathology of uh, anti-corruption in Brazil. Uh, so my uh, argument here is that it's essentially ma largely used as an empty signifier. That is, of course, not to say that there wasn't corruption. Um, uh, but of course, um, the problem is when you start anti-corruption at a particular moment and in relation to particular actors, rather than to look at corruption in a structural sense. What does it have to do with the way the political system is styled? What does it have to do with uh, uh, political culture? And of course, the corruption discussion we've had ever since Lava Jato started, and to be very honest, even the previous big uh, investigation in Lula's first mandate, some may, may remember it, the so-called Mensa Lounge scandal, which was a party financing scandal, essentially, already was in a similar vein. It wasn't as, as you know, as uh, 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 acrimonious, in a sense, as Lava Jato, but it already brought, in a sense, this politicized form of uh, anti-corruption, which prevents, essentially, and has certainly in the Brazilian case, prevented a real discussion about how do we deal uh, with um, political corruption. So, uh, you know, you have, uh, who are the players? You have, you know, uh, basically, uh, or the, the, the corruption discourse goes very much against the state in and of itself. So it's been used very much to push, in a sense, a neolib neoliberal agenda against any kind of state actor. So very strangely, although, as we've just heard, the private sector is deeply involved. I mean, it's the other side of corruption. Odebrecht is a fully private company. Petrobras is, of course, state-owned but it's arm's length state owned, but there is many, uh, certainly in civil engineering, there is many civil construction, there's many uh, purely private companies, yeah? And uh, there's many banks involved as well. Uh, but of course the rage has been almost entirely directed to the state and state actors. Ne? Then so-called state-based elites, the state bureaucracy, political institutions, political parties, um, then, of course, also uh, social uh, corporatist developmentalism, so basically the um, sort of 50s, 60s European style social democracy, for better or worse, you know, it's criticizable. It's certainly in development studies, probably no longer the Vogue model, but that's pretty much what uh, Lulism, in a sense, economic policies, you know, consumption stimuli, uh, a good dose of Keynesianism, without being really too radical, has to be understood. Lulis, Lulis Brazil was never Venezuela, was never Bolivia, was always very much a global player within the current, current setup, in a sense, but of course tried to uh, uh, attack some of the grossest inequalities in particular. Uh, and address some of the grossest misgivings, in a sense. And, uh, but of course, uh, so the rage of uh, corruption has been directed against that. So what are the actual foundations of, uh, of, of corruption? Uh, uh, you really have to go uh, back very deeply. Colonial legacies, I mean, the entire form in which the po formerly Portuguese colony was run from the very beginning. Uh, would by today's standards and by Lava Jato's standards, of course, be corrupt. Yeah, but in the same sense, and I'm now going to be a little bit uh, controversial as a, as also a German, uh, as for example, the German Wirtschaftswunder in the 1950s, probably by the standards of Lava Jato, by today's standards, would be considered corrupt, because you had corporatist, very close ties between industry, government, in order to generate basically uh, growth, to generate jobs, generate income. You know, that was the main. Uh, main thing, and of course, um, that that system. If you look too into it from a certain type of angle, you will always find practices that, by today's standards, will be considered corrupt. Yeah. Um, you have to go, of course, into the whole uh, so-called uh, uh, Slavocracy, the the uh, entirely, in a sense, uh, structurally unprocessed uh, uh, heritage of of slavery, which really is the nucleus of extreme inequality, uh, even today in Brazil, not just economic equality, but also social inequality, extreme social stratification, and of course the extractivist model, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, Brazilian capital class has always essentially looked at 
uh, at profit, no matter what. So if that profit could be obtained inside Brazil, fine. If that profit couldn't be obtained inside Brazil, but through monies parked outside Brazil, then also fine. There's never been uh, amongst the Brazilian private sector, certainly, a, a national development project. And that's precisely what, to a certain extent, the Lulist policies try to uh, introduce, reintroduce. There have been periods in the 20s, 30s, 40s, when this was a little bit on the agenda, it then sort of went out again. And of course, the Lulist period reintroduced that. And that's also ultimately what the Lava Jato then is uh, directed against. You have uh, the so-called patrimonialism context, yeah, where you have, uh, from the beginning, a very strong public-private entanglement. You have state society entanglement, and you have, of course, uh, a paradigm of state capitalism to a certain extent, which produces, obviously, the kind of uh, uh, close ties that are then quite easy to decipher or to reframe as uh, forms of corruption. Yeah. Uh, you also have, of course, the, fa the famous cordialism, the fact that you don't, I mean, it, it's very personalist, everything depends on, much depends on personal network, yeah. Uh, and uh, you have, of course, uh, what you now call corruption would, uh, uh, by anthropologists or in earlier times, be easily called, uh, you know, uh, favorism or uh, the so-called Jaichinyone, the little way, which again is not necessarily, and I think is even from an anthropological point of view, wrong to stylize as corruption, but is simply trying to work in a contingent environment with the factors that you have at hand and trying to resolve problems. It's indeed not, it doesn't follow a strict norm and rule-guided uh, uh, rule uh, framework, but it's not uh, uh, a priori, of course, dysfunctional. So you then had, of course, the reformist politics. Yeah? Uh, uh, you had, in Brazil, uh, reformism always meant centralization. In India, it's the other way around. Uh, reformism always was decentralization. In Brazil, it's the regional elites were always the backwards elites, so you had to centralize in order to get at them. So again, the rage is, against, is directed against that. Uh, the, you have um, this strange, I as German had to learn very hard that nationalism in Latin America, in Brazil, in Peru as well, is a left wing, is a sort of positive thing versus, uh, to a certain extent, it's not uh, linked to, in a sense, the uh, ethno-nationalism that we uh, in Europe often associate nationalism with, but it's very much linked to economic nationalism. The idea, you know, uh, domestic development versus basically having both foreign capital in the country and the country's capital in banks abroad, in a sense. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's strongly, uh, you know, underlies this. Uh, you have um, then, of course, uh, nowadays a sort of uh, hyper-normativity, yes? So you have a very independent, very strong uh, judicial sphere. And this is important to understand. I think in Europe we tend to uh, not see this uh, sufficiently, we tend to see either the rule of law works or it doesn't work. And my contention, for example, is in the Brazilian case, it is working. It is absolutely working. It has pushed its limits. And you could certainly make cases on the margins, for example, of Lava Jato, that the criminal law, even by Brazilian standards, has been pushed. But it has been pushed in a legal way. It's not entirely outside of law. It's not that sort of uh, Manichaean image of sort of uh, backroom manipulators who just say, you know, let's just do it, you know, apply force and power versus the law. But the law is actually working, but it produces, of course, total dysfunctionality right now. Yeah? It has essentially destroyed the Brazilian economy, and it has, to a certain extent, destroyed the Brazilian political system. Um, so what are the contemporary conjunctures? Uh, you have, of course, one uh, fundamental underlying issue, which is imperfect presidentialism. I'll show you the result very briefly. How long do I have? Another two minutes? Yeah, OK. So I'll be very, very quick. And we'll, uh, isn't it this sort of on Mars or something? Two minutes is longer? Yeah, so we'll just, <laughs> anyways. Uh, uh, so uh, the current Brazilian Congress has 30 parties. The previous Brazilian Congress had 20, either 25 or 27. I can't remember now. So this is what imperfect presidentialism is for you, meaning uh, you have a directly um, uh, uh, elected president, but you have a multi-party Congress. So no president, not Lula, not Dilma, and not Bolsonaro, in fact, has ever a parliamentary majority. Uh, in a situation where you only really have, I mean, this is the new configuration, which is no longer, as I said, it's, it's completely wiped out, the old one, but very traditionally, you had essentially only three larger parties. Yeah? 
uh, the PT, uh, the PSDB, sort of center left, center right, plus uh, a middle of the ground uh, graft, uh, local, and in a sense, very deeply corrupt party, the PMDB. And, um, but none of them ever would have majorities, so they would always have to ally with uh, any number here of these uh, entirely small, entirely popular, uh, uh, you know, entirely uh, opportunistic parties. And so obviously, so obviously, um, you would, uh, you would uh, very easily uh, get, um, get into uh, uh, party financing, coalition building problems. I mean, uh, one of the biggest discussion today is the left is, of course, also split in Brazil. There is a dissident left that is critical of Lulism, highly critical, and their part argument is Lula should have insisted on much deeper political reform to avoid this kind of uh, scenario. Uh, but of course, the question is, uh, 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 in order to assure govern governmentality within the constitutional framework, uh, that's basically what you have to do. You have to build a, to build a coalition in these extremely uh, volatile multi-party uh, uh, multi uh, congresses. Yeah? Um, I'm going to have to cut sort of uh, much of this short, but generally, of course, you had... Uh, you had basically, uh, during the last 14 years of Lulism, a situation where you had uh, uh, not so much uh, the rise of a new middle class, but more uh, the rise of a new proper working class from uh, a sub-proletarian working class, in a sense. That's what most of the social polities have provided. But of course, their political horizon wasn't that of a new working class, but of a new middle class. And that started to be majorly disappointed with the economic downturn, which was uh, caused, of course, by the uh, end of the commodity boom, and, of course, uh, to a certain extent by, by, um, by corruption. But uh, that, of course, was never, uh, was, never, uh, was never... This is my last slide, yeah? So I am literally uh, finishing, yes. Uh, 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 <laughs> corruption was never uh, proven to be the main driving force of the economic downturn, but it was used, of course, as that argument. So essentially, the entire pre-election period uh, last year, essentially the entire intermission after the impeachment of Dilma and then up to the election, was essentially uh, a, a political discourse spun by, by initially the centre-right and then picked up by the ultra-right, the Bolsonaro, Bolsonaristas, about uh, uh, you know, why basically um, uh, 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 the PT uh, equals corruption. Uh, corruption equals uh, developmentalism. Developmentalism e uh, equals the left. Which is nowadays, for example, why anyone advocating any of these, or even just advocating, for example, social equality programming or so, uh, is called a communist by the government. Yeah? So I'm a communist, and we're all communists in a sense, in that sense, probably. So that's what Lava Jato, to a certain extent, has done. Yeah. Um, uh, this was partly uh, made possible by a self-empowerment of the judiciary, a uh, sort of juristocracy in which, uh, as we've seen in a sense, the judiciary operates entirely parallelly to the political system. They are strongly aligned in their majority to uh, initially the center-right, now to a certain extent the Bolsonaros, although to a lesser extent, yeah. Uh, they've always, of course, denied these affiliations, but uh, in public, this is my last slide, uh, my, my last uh, graph, uh, X, um, in public opinion, of course, uh, uh, it's always been quite clear that, uh, you know, this is so, uh, how many people think that, for example, uh, so 91% um, uh, uh, of people think that uh, Lava Jato should investigate all uh, politicians, yeah, but... Uh, only uh, certain uh, 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 37 people uh, percent of people think that, um, uh, uh, or uh, sorry, um, or rather this one here. Yeah, um, only 41 percent think that it actually is investigating all politicians. So even public opinion, in a sense, is quite uh, quite certain about the fact that it was always also at least parallelly a political project. But that, of course, doesn't mean once again, and this is my true concluding phrase now, uh, doesn't mean that the political system and the legal system are actually merged or more entirely entangled. They are distinct, they are separate, and yet they work in parallel to ultimately, currently, very similar effects. And I think this is something for research for us to yet better understand. So this is not the old story, the rule of law is not working. It is working, and yet it's not working.
And that's what Brazil is, basically. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camila. Thank you so much, Florian. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for the good introductions to the topic. I would like to just ask uh, one or two questions before I open uh, for the floor. You are talking about uh, the rule of law, that the rule of law exists in Brazil. Uh, but I want to understand, uh, can this fight against uh, corruption uh, in a, in a young democracy like Brazil uh, also lead to, 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 the, to, to, to the destruction of the, of the whole uh, political setup because seemingly the corruption that is being uh, fought against is only uh, targeted at the political elites. Can that disrupt the whole uh, political project in Brazil? Like the political system? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it can and, and already has. I mean, the last election certainly means that, you know, the institutions aren't destroyed. This is not, in a sense, yet at least, a proper dictatorship, although it has strong authoritarian undercurrents. But, of course, the institutions continue to work, the judiciary continues to work, the Supreme Court continues to work, and not always in the government's way. But, of course, uh, you're entirely right. Uh, what the Lava Jato investigation, I think, has done, has it has instilled a structural level distrust in the political system itself, which opens the way on one hand for, for populist strongmen like Bolsonaro, of course, but makes it extremely difficult for the other side to reconstruct that trust mm -hmm. yeah, in the terms of representative constitutional democracy as they are foreseen in the 88 constitution. So an, uh, either the other side uh, tries, in a sense, to mimic the populist move, which is probably, I would personally think, uh, untenable under different political, uh, you know, preconditions pre in a sense. I mean, you can't can't just replicate uh, right-wing populism on the left, so to speak. Yeah, mm. uh, or you have to really think think something very new. I mean, this is partly why the reaction to uh, to Bolsonaro in Brazil so far has been quite mooted because people are literally quite shell shocked. It's very very it's a very difficult scenario to come to grips with and and think about in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Camilla, I would like to ask you about uh, Viscara's uh, <laughs> dissolution of Congress because uh, I, I have seen that he also wants to he wants to change the constitution. Uh, uh, I want I want to I want to understand is this uh, is this uh, call for the elections popular in in Peru? Yeah. I yeah, I, I think that we have to understand that there was a block by by the, by the Congress. So they, they, they didn't allow to, to any of the reforms to go ahead. So what happened in Peru last year is because of this, all these corruption cases, um, there was an idea, okay, we, we need to change the political party system. And they, they sent a, a, a group of reforms to the Congress to be discussed on how to change uh, was a political reform. And there was a proposal to the Congress, and, they, and, they, and that means, and, they, and that includes a lot of things related to the political party system, in a way, because we know that this can affect also all the, all the political parties. And then Vizcarra, and because the Congress didn't allow that debate to go ahead, Vizcarra on, on, on July said, okay, I'm going to send a constitutional, uh, a bill for a constitutional reform to call for early elections in 2020, because this is not going to any way, and, and we need new, new elections and that. And they blocked that in the in the Congress, uh, like, like one, two weeks ago. So that was the constitutional reform that he asked for. And and now he, what he did is using a constitutional mechanisms to, to close the Congress. Um, so he's not asking now for a, a constitutional reform. He's he's now saying the risk is that now he can govern without a Congress, without a legislative, so without a power balance. So that that is risky because. Uh, we don't know really. I mean, this guy was not elected. We, we elect Kuczynski, and he was his vice president. Um, and 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 Peru is is a country that without political parties. So we don't have really political. We have like political movement where people have a political 
party, like it's more like a brand, and call people with money to be part of. And, and, and so that is, that is complicated. So what is going on is he's going to govern until January without a Congress. And, uh, and we will see how this, this goes. So yeah. we, we, it, it's, it's not ideal. We, we, we have to see. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Camille. Uh, I would like to, to invite the audience to, to comment or ask questions to the panelists. We have a microphone at the back. Oh, <laughs> that's a fancy microphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a... Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for your introductions. They're very good. Uh, one thing I, I know is the total absence of any reference to the USA's role in these, uh, these changes in Brazil and Peru that have happened. Uh, both these cases bear the hallmarks of uh, what they call uh, uh, golpe suaves, so meek coups or constitutional uh, coups. And uh, the USA has had a program of training uh, judicial people, high court judges and that, and uh, influencing very much of, of what they do in these countries. Judge Moro from Brazil has, has had a, a long cooperation with the State Department and has also attended many of these uh, US financed uh, course training courses. So I wonder if, they, if this has uh, any important effect because there is a geopolitical attempt to pr try to maintain friendly, neoliberal, US uh, friendly governments in, uh, in the continent, and, uh, and maybe you could say something about this. I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, we, I, I represent Latin America Group in Bergen. We have invited uh, Emir Sader All right, from uh, uh, the University of Rio yes, de Janeiro yes. to Bergen the 23rd of October. He is uh, somebody who has been very uh, involved in, in like the world social movement, but he is also the, uh, leading the campaign to free Lula. So we'll be having a meeting on the 23rd of October at the, at the, at the uh, library in Berlin. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this. Yeah, thank you very much for two fascinating uh, presentations. So, uh, you, Camila, started with saying that you know your whole childhood, Peru follows Brazil. I'm wondering if I could turn the question around. And what I wonder about is what you guys you think of Brazil maybe following Peru, because corruption or corruption affecting the political system is not new. In, I mean, if I understand. Peruvian history correctly. That is how the party system collapsed in the 1990s, you know, because of people seeing the polit political parties so corrupt. And then, I don't know if this is a right interpretation, but it seems like it's a very rational idea for politicians not to have parties, because then they don't have to be accountable to anything. And, and I'm wondering if this sort of collapse of a party system and this sort of everyone for themselves and, you know, corruption being something we can use as leverage. If that is maybe where Brazil is going. And I apologize if that was an incorrect interpretation. No. Of, I've only <laughs> <laughs> and you can correct me. Where do I send this? Because I love sending. No, the, there was. Mike? Are you sure? Because it's so far. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone wants it? It's a very impressive mic. Oh, I will, I will allow it's the... my favorite. It's like totally <laughs> I will allow the panelists uh, to to respond to the to the two questions, and then I open up again. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I, I think that that we have also to understand that Peru have to go, uh, went through a internal war, so that also affect the, the political system in the 80s and, and, and in the 90s. And, and Fujimori was an outsider. So it was a, like a, the first example of an outsider that we have in the, in the, in the, in the, in the country. And, um, and has been super difficult to, to reveal the, the political party system. There was some institutional reform for the decentralization that also affect the, the, the indirectly and, and affect the political party system. So, so what we have now is that, like a, Movements and 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 that is uh, and this idea of politicians as corrupt as corrupt uh, 
that is also risky because we need to, to build something there. And um, so, and I don't see that, I don't think that many people understand in the region what is going on in Peru. Uh, it's like, because it's, it's contagious. I mean, we have a former president that killed himself in his house, and that was dramatic. And 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 and, and it's like uh, people is saying, yeah, see, see what is going on. Uh, so you can really make people to get crazy and, and kill himself. They say you continue to be so hard with the, with the investigation. I think that is something that I I, I, I listen to some people in Colombia, and they were concerned because uh, Alan Garcia killed him, but. I don't think that they understand that Alan Garcia tried to went out from the country, asked for an asylum in Uruguay, he was rejected, and then he came himself, and that I was everything so super dramatic. So, um, so, and, and again, as as in the case of, of Brazil, we, we need to, to to see how this is affecting the party system, and we are not having the discussion on that. And and, and again, with the with this idea of. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, Domingo Perez or, or Caruancho has been part of the training system for the USAID, but there, there, there is also, we, we need to be more critical on how we are financing the political system in this country and what is the way that the private companies are acting and what it means to have these open liberal companies because what Odebrecht was doing is to pay favors or in advance to these politicians, to all the political spectrum, to make business, and the business were legal. So we don't really know if all these people will be sent to jail because what's legal. Now it's not legal because we make some reforms, but until this moment, it was legal. So all these guys, they were probably legal. Keiko was not in power. The problem with Keiko is that her links are also with the narco. That is why she's more, much more afraid, because the money for the people in the party is from the narco. It's not over, Odebrecht. Odebrecht only gives her half a million dollars. It's nothing. So, but the links with her is with the narco. And that is, that is the money that she doesn't want to disclose. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to the one on the, on the influence of the USA. Uh, Lorian, yeah, your response. Yeah, I was going response. to initially yeah. respond yeah. to that. And okay. Thank you very much for the comments. And uh, the omission of the US, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the omission on again? Yeah. yeah. The omission of the US was just time, basically, <laughs> and rush. But the thing is, of course, there is uh, this strong uh, conviction, especially among the uh, uh, Latin American, Brazilian left, that the US is, in a sense, behind all evils, you know. And uh, I think uh, one has to be a bit more differentiating. So the US has an absolutely pivotal role, but I think it's where it gets interesting is when we really try to decipher what, what is its role. So there is certainly the geopolitical thing. I mean, the US always has had... Um, it, it never has had a, a domestic industrial policy. It has always had a foreign economic policy. It create conditions for the U.S. private sector to thrive. And, of course, that uh, includes, in the Brazilian case, oil and includes certainly, to a certain extent, the financial industry. So there is a strong interest in resting, in a sense. And, and Lulism very much was about economic... I mean, not protectionism, that they were never really protectionist, but it was about a degree of economic nationalism, a degree of let's, you know, let's not open up uh, everything uh, indiscriminately, in a sense, uh, for uh, foreign capital and investment, which is exactly what, of course, the current government is now doing. Everyone thinks they are preparing for the privatization of Petrobras, and everyone thinks that the conglomerates that will pick it up for probably too mu much too little a price will be, uh, you know, U.S. and, and, and some other um, uh, interests. And, of course, the U.S. government is indeed, uh, but not only since Trump, I mean, since almost always, and certainly, un one has to say, under Obama as well, Hillary Clinton's approach as Secretary of State to Latin America, to Venezuela, for example, was very contrarian, in a sense, to some of the regional attempts to, to deal with that, in a sense. So that is very clear. Uh, then, of course, there is uh, now uh, uh, an influence in terms of... Uh, there, there is, of course, the obvious uh, influence in terms of anti-corruption, uh, and I think there's a confluence to a certain extent between different administration in the US. I think uh, anti-corruption as a general tool to advance, uh, uh, to advance a shift 
especially in post-transition global southern democracies, from executive and legislative-led government to judiciary, judicial government, which is basically restrict the state, restrict legislatures, restrict executives in their ability to promote essentially social policy. That too, I think, has been strongly on the agenda, and that I think that's where uh, the Moro reception in the U.S., which he made a maximum of in Brazil, you know, this prize, that prize, Yale, Harvard, whatever, you know, he's been, you know, the white knight, the white uh, corruption fighting knight. I mean, that, that relation is also very clear. It's not always entirely clear who is behind it. Yes, the CIA works. We also, also though, know that the CIA is sometimes overestimated in its capacity. No? I mean, we've seen this most recently in the Venezuela thing, you know, with Trump saying, oh, we're going to go in, etc. And then suddenly no one goes in because they realize it's actually way too dangerous to do this. Mm -hmm. so, so they haven't really, they're not entirely in control. On a more subtle level, I would say, one, uh, another influence is, of course, that uh, uh, the what what enabled uh, really the numbers for Bolsonaro, it's, it's estimated that sort of the, the Nazi clown constituency is, is between 15 and 20 percent of the electorate. And that, of course, doesn't win you an election. And the remainder was an anti-PT, anti-vote, uh, which was largely generated through the corruption discourse, uh, and also uh, a neo-Pentecostal evangelical uh, 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 electorate yeah? that, that really brings in sort of the, the masses. And of course, those uh, 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 neo-Pentecostalism is extremely on the advance in Brazil, in all of Latin America. And of course, there are very evident links between uh, U.S. churches. I mean, the, 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 you know, there's a deep entanglement in a sense between these very business-like administered uh, churches. They're almost like religious companies, you could argue, yeah, that, that work in... in um, in uh, Brazil. And lastly, there is an evident link, and it's not even secret, it's public between especially Bolsonaro's sons and uh, Steve Bannon. And I think it has to be understood that some of the electoral expertise in terms of really uh, generating, bypassing, including the mainstream media, doing the WhatsApp thing, the social media thing, uh, that very much comes from a, you know, a more international orientation that amongst others includes, uh, you know, Bannon's group, uh, although also, for example, people from the Mouvement Identitaire in France, etc. It's a whole ultra right wing global thing. But the US has its, uh, you know, US actors have its, its uh, fingers there, obviously. Yeah, thanks, Florian. Would you like to comment, Camilo, on the influence of the US in Peru? Like, it's important to, to, to say that, um, the influence of, of, of USA in the region is, is there, as, as already has been said, uh, in, in different levels. And in, in Peru, it's not clear the, the link with what is going on with, with the USAID or, or the CIA or, or the government in, in, in Peru. Um, there is a concern from the USA for the war against drugs, uh, for the coca production. Um, but but I think that this that, that what is, we have to see is that it's more like like the ideological influence on on the model on on what is they are interested on what they are going to allow to happen and what they are not going to allow to happen in the in the sense of, of the model of the you have to be uh, trade trade agreements and that and we has been doing that during the 90s and the 2000s so so Peru has been super aligned with the. USAID policies. We didn't have really a left kind of uh, government. And, uh, and I think that it also goes with the, the open capitalist movement because it's in the basis is uh, we don't believe in the state. The entrepreneurship thing is there. And this moral discourse against corruption that is super strong. So we, don't, we, we need to understand also this religious movement as part of the crisis of the political parties and the part of the corruption of the, uh, that is linked to the political parties because this is a moral discourse. So the morality there and the use of this moral discourse against some of the more social policies is, is deeply problematic and we have to understand that. But also because these neo pentecostalists have this idea that to be wealthy and rich is not bad. So it's not this religious idea of the liberal theology that we have to be with the poor. No, we, we don't have to be poor. We have to be by our own means, we have to become rich. And that is something that I think that people 
portrayed as a, this charismatic leader, super rich, and they make uh, jokes about that, they are not understanding nothing what that means. And that is deeply liberal, deeply that you need to, 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 to get a lot of wealth and to not share. And, and you are going to do that by the, your own means, so you don't need a state. Uh, so that is what we have been also selling for a long time to, to people, and, and that is how now this is at the grassroots level, because the pet and consult movement have this kind of pol uh, political and co uh, community level grassroots movement that work like that. And, uh, and no political party in Peru have that capacity to reach small, small communities as this uh, neopolitical uh, movement. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I had promised to open for the floor, but uh, it's already time up. <laughs> <laughs> we had only one hour. It's a pity that we had one hour. Uh, this has been a, a nice discussion. I hope that we have learned uh, a lot from this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Florian, and uh, thank you so much, Camila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the audience. Yeah, have a nice day.